Hello, and welcome back to another episode of God's Business, where I interview the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. The world out there has many different business strategies that a lot of them are blueprints from the Bible, but some of them aren't. Buying and selling is a concept of the world. Sowing and reaping is a concept of heaven. That when you give, it should be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That's just one of the topics that are extremely different. If us as Christians are not building di different businesses or di businesses that look different than the world, then we are just building the same businesses as the world. Now, if the world copies us because they see the success, that's one thing, like giving things away. But if we're the ones copying them, then how are we supposed to build a business that represents Christ and heaven in the marketplace? That's what we're here to deconstruct. And one of the ways I do that is by building and bringing in the best people in the world to teach you. Because again, I don't know all the answers. I'm learning from them as well. Now, if you're a man in business, what you're going to want to do right now is head over to Facebook and type in The King's Brotherhood. We have a group there specifically for other businessmen, over 5,600 other men there that are connecting inside of that group. Again, it's The King's Brotherhood, which you can check out at thekingsbrotherhood.com as well if you want to get to know more of the things that we are all about. Today's guest is ultimately going to serve the person that wants to know, how do you partner with Christ inside of your business? Put in lots and lots of work in faith. There's lots of people that work hard. There's lots of people that have a lot of faith though we know faith without works is dead. It's tough to know the balance between those things. This is someone who actually went to ministry school, ended up going to the same ministry school that I went to, since then has worked closely with churches like Elevation before launching his own church, has had multiple businesses as well. And he's going to share with you guys this topic that I believe is going to absolutely rock your world if you're looking how to partner with Christ inside of what you are doing and work your freaking butt off. Please welcome Mr. Jared Ellis. <music> Jared, what's up, man? Appreciate you being here. Absolutely. I'm super honored, man. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's like full circle. You're really, and I'm doing this from like an outside perspective. It's like that God even talks about how he looks at man different than we look at man. If you look at even like when David was anointed, it was like, oh, this guy would look good in leadership. So though success isn't just about this, what you've done is you've built something successful where it's done a lot of really good things and there's fruit on the tree of what you've been doing. I've done it in a whole different realm. And so coming together for people that don't know, we literally went to school and ministry at the exact same place at the exact same time. And so it's awesome to see the people that have just stuck around. You know, I'm sure that being in ministry, you've seen this. There's probably people that went into ministry the same time as you and maybe they just stopped. And then after a while, you're kind of left with just the handful of people that are like, the lone survivors, but yep. I appreciate it, man. It's so cool to have you here. Yeah, dude. Success is outlasting everyone and just being the last one standing because I think you would probably agree. It's, you know, there, there's talent and, you know, competency that, that makes us together to make successful people. But a lot of it is the ability to endure and just to continue on um, what would normally take people out, discouragement, failures, disappointments, um, you just got to have like Teflon skin, you know, and just be willing to continue to believe that you're going to make it. And so that's one of the things that I love too, is seeing people that haven't quit and, you know, had a dream in their heart. They believe God gave them that dream, whether that's in business, ministry, family, education, arts, entertainment. It's like, this is what's in my heart. And, um, you know, I think we live in a generation that's so used to immediate overnight viral success that we think that if it takes time or if it takes longer than we expected, then maybe it's not so successful. Uh, but I found that success is the stuff that lasts for a lifetime and isn't a firework that just kind of burns out quickly. And so, yeah, I love seeing what you guys are doing, that you're still at it and you're crushing it, influencing so many people and uh, changing the lives of you know, individuals, families, entrepreneurs, and uh, yeah, it's just incredible to be a part of it. So super honored yeah. to be. What do you, what do you see with that even? Because I look at like biblical times, or if you read through the Bible, you look at people that were so kind of hidden, being prepared for all of a sudden this next like move, and a lot of times it was very, very less glorious than the next phase, right? Like David, Goliath, and then like everyone thinks he's amazing. 
and still wasn't that cool, but there's still lots of people following him, lots of success. And then King, and you look at like Joseph, it, it's like, that's not that cool of a life. And then it's like, Oh wow, that's a really cool life. But now with what you're talking about, like this microwave mentality, how do you decipher that? Cause even as a business owner, you look, I look at mostly people that just self-sabotage. They're like, mm -hmm. Oh God, when God's ready to blow up this business, you know, I'm here, I'm just being qualified and ready. And I'm just like, you just don't know how to market. Like yep. I look at it right here and you're just like off. How do you kind of decipher that nowadays where it's like that timing of, of coming from kind of God's qualifying from fighting lions to fighting Goliath. Yeah. in a day now where things are supposed to always happen fast. Like if you want to start a business, it's like, God's got to bless it. Now you got to be successful now at 20 years old. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, how have you been able to navigate that with also looking at what's happening in scripture as well? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's so many reasons to wait or to give yourself an excuse as to why you shouldn't step out in something or on the flip side of that, you know, a reason to quit and say, well, it hasn't happened yet. It's never going to happen. And the reality is like our journeys are all different. And I, I know I grew up with this mentality because I grew up in an Italian household, which means I have an Italian mother who loves her Italian sons and tells us that we're the, you know, we're the wealth of the earth and we're going to just take over and we're, you know, we're winners. And I, I believe that I'm super, super grateful for the confidence that, you know, my parents instilled in me. But I had this wonderkin mentality that like, I'm just going to crush everything I do and everything I touch is going to turn to gold immediately. And while there's always been a level of success and favor on my life in every season, and I've been in a lot of different um, cities, movements, churches, ministries, businesses, my wife and I involved in different things, real estate. And what I've learned the longer I've done life is that the journey is rarely ever just up and to the right. It, it just doesn't really work that way. I mean, there are definitely those stories of people that seem to have exploded out of nowhere and just skyrocket in success. I'd say that that's a really, really small percentage. And even those stories tend to have the iceberg, um, you know, story of success behind them that we just don't know. The years of preparation and connections and network and endurance and so for me, you know, when I look in the scriptures, I actually wrote a book on Joseph because I most identify with that story um, is there's a lot of back and forth. You, you kind of rise and then you get knocked down and you rise again. And the Bible says the righteous man falls down seven times, but he gets back up. And so if you have this ideology that I'm just because now, you know, I'm stepping out of faith or God's called me or I've got a dream that I'm just going to succeed wildly from the beginning. I think you're living with some rose colored glasses and those are going to get shattered soon, you know, especially in the business world, especially now um, you've got to have some thick skin and you've got to really believe something I've learned in ministry and in business is that there is, there's a threshold marker where, you know, time preparation, and simply just the the amount of time for you to truly believe in what's in you, not only is there a spiritual, spiritual principle of things kind of waiting to trigger into that critical mass level of success, but people around you are also waiting. You know, it's not hard to start something. I mean, maybe for some people, it's difficult to step out and start, but most of us can get something started. The question is, can we stick with it when nobody else believes, but you're the only one that believes, can you continue to believe? And so there's a threshold moment where, you know, there's enough time that's gone by of faith and pushing through and enduring to where the situation and the people and the circumstances around you catch up with the vision that's inside of you. And then boom, it triggers something of success and that just takes time. And so I think biblically speaking, we see that even in Jesus. I mean, Jesus started his public ministry at 30 years old. And so, you know, we know that he was doing great things early on, but there comes a time when that critical mass hits. And I think we've got to have patience and we've got to have foresight and vision enough to believe that it's going to happen even when we don't see it right now. Yeah, even in the business world, there's a quote that says, you're never paid what you're worth. You're always mm -hmm. underpaid until you're overpaid. And right. you see some people maybe in their later years or later stages in business, and you're like, whoa, bro, you get paid how much to do what? And it's like, 
no, they're they're now overpaid for what they do because of the that consistency, the reputation, and then everyone is going to be underpaid in the beginning because no one knows who you are, what you've done, uh, and so it's very interesting how that process. Also in in ministry, I'm in, interested to hear your thought process on this because I feel that starting in ministry is much more spiritual than it is physical, and then lasting in ministry obviously can have a physical component. One of the hardest things for me was going from ministry to business was so much about skill set. And like, it was a physical thing, almost like a sport. You can't like pray your way to be a football player. Like you kind of can, but you, but most of the time that probably wouldn't happen or like to throw a hundred mile an hour fastball. Like you just absolutely have to actually get good at it. And I kind of talk about like Solomon finding the bronze worker. It's like, who's the best at bronze? Cool. And I'm like, dude, the wisest guy in the world didn't know what he was doing with bronze. Like he was wise, but like he didn't know how to physically work with that. Like this brought someone else in. A and in business, I had none of that. So I came in thinking I was just going to pray my way through it. And I had no skills, like just physical, like you can't be a chef. Mm -hmm. Like you don't know how long to put in the oven. Uh, and I'm, I'm walking lightly here because I'm like, well, unless. You know, it's like Smith Wigglesworth didn't know how to read either. And then homie could preach and read. So there's miracles. And I love that. But for you being in ministry, was it, what's the balance of the, the spiritual side, which is like just teaching God's word, moving in the gifts of the spirit, seeing God move, which isn't really skill. I'm like walking the line. Like, it's like, you're just like, can I pray? You pray for someone to get healed, they get healed. You're like, wow, that's amazing. I took that into business and I was like, it's not working. Right. Uh, and then obviously there's the physical side of what you guys have had to steward and maintain in buildings and staff mm -hmm. and help and collaboration. How, how is, what's been the balance of that, the spiritual side of ministry, as well as the actual physical side of ministry where it's skill and like building up the skill set? Yeah, I actually would say it's probably flipped around where you said it kind of starts spiritual and then maybe to sustain it is, is physical. I, I think it's actually more so flipped in the ministry world because and i think it may even translate to business in the sense that you get to a point where you've built something substantial enough to where you're able to become a specialist and focus on the thing that you do best whereas in the beginning just like in launching a business and you know my wife and i we've we've we launched, uh, we had two restaurants here in Sacramento, been involved in business, you know, in the past few years. Um, we've, you know, we've invested in property, property management. So we've got a lot of different experiences. She was in the business world for her, you know, her whole career until we met and jumped into ministry. And so it's the same thing as launching a church. When you launch a church, you don't have the luxury to be a specialist. You have to be everything because you don't have yeah. the staff and you yep. don't have um, and so something I, I, you know, when I was in Bible college, this was before Bethel, when I was in Dallas, uh, you know, I, I learned this growing up in church because I've been in church my whole life. But I realized that if you want to be somebody that makes a career out of doing ministry, you have to be able to provide the most amount of value. And when people think about people in ministry, they think, can you preach? Can you sing? You know. Um, can you pray for people? That's that's not what we pay people to do because anybody can do that and not get paid to do it. And so I have people, you know, my church that want to you know, j join our staff and they think that because they can minister to somebody that that qualifies them to be on staff. And I'm like, I don't hire people because they can minister to people. I hire people because they can manage people in ministry. And so there's a difference wow. in, you know, the spiritual work that we do but then the very practical work of running a church which is that that includes you know financials budgets uh boards staff oversight uh communications and so something i i learned early on was i've got to be able to provide the most amount of value and i think it's the reason why i became a senior pastor at 27 was i came in as a graphic designer i'm a videographer i can do music I can lead teams, I can communicate, I know my way around budgets. I, you know, so I've been in executive roles. And so I, I had the skill set that I had developed over years that could get me in the door of management, 
But then wow. once I built something, it allowed me to move more into a specialist role. But it wasn't that way in the beginning. And so, you know, we're we're running portable facilities, you know, set, set up and tear down of church and managing volunteers. And I say, like, you know, one of the best things that you can do to grow as a leader is to learn how to lead in a church environment because I've got to incentivize people without finances. I got to incentivize people without bonuses. I have to get people to serve, give their time, give their money um, without paying them anything. And so, you know, I think you really develop leadership skills within that sector when you realize that if you are not the incentive, being around you, gleaning from you, your life as a leader is enough for people to say, I want to give my time, my money and my talents to be around you uh, without getting paid for it. That's the mark of do you have actual influence or, you know, is the paycheck your influencer? And so for me, it's, it, you know, the, the, the managing of that tension is I've I always have to be competent at what I do. My spiritual life, prayer, you know, worship, all that stuff, that's for me to be sustained in the long run, right? To make sure that I'm a good person, I'm a good husband, that I love my family, that I that I am a, a pastor with integrity, all those things. That's what's going to keep me going. But I think in the immediate now, you know, we're about to expand our facility. We're about to do a massive capital campaign. And it's like, if you're not competent in knowing how to fundraise, network, build relationships, uh, you know, architects, designing buildings, like if you don't know how to get your way around that stuff and you know, you've got to just pay for somebody to do that, you will never do it because it, you know this in the beginning of a business, you don't have the money to pay somebody to do that. You have to figure it out. And so it, it takes a lot of skill work. It takes a lot of competency. Uh, I'm running a business. There's a level of running a business that, you know, we, we have uh, to be responsible for, and, and we take that seriously. Totally, man. There's a phenomenal pastor at, out, Steve Smotherman, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they have like you know 250 full time employees, and they have 27,000 members of their church, and it's like there's so much in there that you're like, oh my goodness, this is literally the the skills of running a business. Like you have to have people, and and then that doesn't include all the however many volunteers would be also involved in that entire thing that you were talking about. What's interesting to me is the path that you went down. You talked about the businesses, restaurant, real estate, et cetera. What's been the balance for you? Like of like what kept you from just going all in and building business stuff? What's kept you in, in ministry? And also there's lots of ministry people that don't do any business stuff, right? So it's like, you've kind of hand your, had your hands in these things. Have you ever been kind of like, oh man, it'd be kind of nice to just go over here and like pop up more restaurants and not have to, literally you have to be there like every, every week. Like yeah, well, I'll tell you, a, I never... a lot. you can't like go on vacation for a month. You can, but that takes like, you know, people do that way later when everything's kind of structured, you kind of like have to be there. That could, I feel right. that I see pastors do it so graciously, but I feel that I'm like, man, like you must have grace for this because I couldn't imagine to be like, what are we doing this weekend? Well, we can't do anything this weekend because yeah. we're like, we're here, you know? So what what was the, the pull for that? Why did you end up doing that? Yeah, well, I can tell you, I definitely have, have not thought I'd want to do more restaurants because I, I we're, we're done with that now. That was a, I mean, it was a good venture for when it was, but um, you talk about having to be there. That is That, that industry is so time consuming, resource consuming. Um, but it was a great lesson for us. And, you know, we learned a lot from, from that, but yeah, I mean, I, I knew I was called to ministry since, uh, since I was 16. And for me, there's never been a question that I could do other things. Um, I, I know that I've been, I'm gifted in other areas and I, you know, even being in the business world or doing real estate, I mean, literally right before this, I came from a duplex that we own and doing property management. We're flipping it, you know, around and it's like, it's it's a part of our lives that we've got our hands in other things. Um, at the end of the day, I know I'm called to ministry. That's my assignment for my life. And so uh, I'm also an all in all the time type of person. And so um, I, I embarrassingly can admit that my wife taught me how to play poker for the first time last month on our sabbatical. And uh, and uh, she's making fun of me because I have a strategy and it's all in all the time. It's a terrible strategy. I wouldn't I wouldn't tell people to do that. But but 
she says, you know, that's, that's kind of how I am in general in my life. Everything I do, it's all in all the time, whether it's, you know, CrossFit or it's church or business marriage. And so it, it has been challenging for me to learn how to balance everything because I'm so passionate about what I do. And I've, I've just learned, you know, I've been doing ministry since I was 16 now and I'm, I'm 33. So I've had enough time to figure out like what my capacity is and what boundaries I need to put in place in order to do what I do well. Um, I say like, I know what my no is because I know what my yes is. And so yeah. because I've defined my yes, it's easy for me to budget out my no. And it's not because those aren't good things or things I enjoy, but they don't necessarily factor into the greater assignment for my life. And so, for example, you know, traveling ministry is a part of my life. I travel and I speak at conferences and, or I do podcasts like this and I love to do them, but they only can fit within a certain amount of my time. And so I was, you know, given two opportunities in the next three weeks to go to Brazil, to go to London. And I'd love to do those things. I love to travel. I love to see different cultures and minister to different people, but we've got a capital campaign coming up the church. We're about to expand and I cannot, in my in my responsible role as the leader of this organization, I just know that right now I could do those things, but the main assignment would suffer. And so yeah. knowing what your yes is in a season allows you to budget your no effectively and say, you know, that's great, but it's not going to lead to the greater purpose of my life. And so it's always a it's always a tension and it's always changing because life looks differently, you know, and I'm sure you know this, like when you had children, it's like things shift and change and priorities and time. And so, you know, you, you run with the rhythms and you figure out what works for you in that season. Yeah. There, there's even in business, right. There's like, you have monthly objectives that you right. would hope that everyone kind of looks at in the lens of everything that they do runs through that, which is, yep. Hey, is this contributing to these two or three things? And if not, can we kind of push that down? Because right. we really need to get these things done. And then for people that are even starting out, it's I like what you talked about with even the passions and responsibilities. That's where it clicked for me, where I have a lot of passions, right? Like I believe yeah. I could pretty much do anything. So I'm like, oh, golf. I'm like, I like that. I'm like, I think I could be Tiger Woods. Oh, like legit. Man. I'm just like, I don't know why. I'm just like, I could do that. And yeah. so then it was like, when you talk about your business or your ministry or then deeper your calling, that's like your responsibilities and maybe mm -hmm. some of that fits with like your family. So mm -hmm. I started going, what's your, where do your passions and your responsibilities kind of overlap? Whereas like yeah. it, you might be passionate about going to Brazil and that'd be so fun, but you got to ask yourself like, does this fit underneath my responsibility category as well? And you don't want to just do responsibilities where you're like, hate your life. You never graduate out of it. You know, you're running the restaurant and you're just like, man, I don't like this. Like I'm dealing with my responsibilities, but I don't, I have no passion kind of find those like places where they overlap. And it seems yep. like those two lenses, you have the practical monthly, Hey, we have a, we have a fundraising campaign, like, or yep. whatever word you use, which was really cool. What was the word? It's like yeah. a yeah. capital, capital raise. Yeah. Uh, and, and so you have that, but then also on the practical level, even just the day to day, like where do my passions, my responsibilities overlap? We both went to school. What, what was the reason? Like what drew you to, to Bethel. This was what, 2011 to 2014 or something? When did you go? I just did one year. So it was about 2011 to 2012. Um, cool. Yeah, it was, it was a What made you do one year? Yeah. So I just had graduated Bible college in Dallas. And mm -hmm. so I went to BSSM to do the first year, which was already challenging for me. Um, it was, it was a tough decision. Um, I had gotten connected with the Bethel worship guys because I, I did worship. And so um, Brian and Janet invited me out and said, you know, we, we think there could be a future for you here. I felt like God was calling me just to take a year and to kind of press into some things that I felt like um, I was ready to go out and just start traveling, at, you know, doing uh, conferences and speaking. And I had actually no interest in pastoring, but um, I, I felt like I was ready and just kind of sensed from the Lord, like I was supposed to go a little bit deeper in, in who I was, my identity. And so 
um, moved out to Reading, and that was that was a painful year for me, um, which was bizarre because like everyone else around me felt like they were in heaven, and I felt like I was in hell because I had just completed Bible college, and I'm starting back first year with a bunch of like 17 year olds, and it was it was just challenging uh, to my pride, my ego, and had to deal with a lot of like identity stuff in that. And it was a good season for me to figure out some of those things. And, um, and I think it was through that year of like processing through who am I, am I just a preacher and just a minister or am I more than that was what allowed me to step into pastoring at a healthy place. Because I think, um, I was still in this vein of like this, you know, I, like I said, I started full-time ministry when I was 16. And so I've been pastoring and preaching as a teenager, you know, traveling as a young person, uh, you know, in New York. And so it just became like my identity. And so I didn't really have anything else to me outside of that. And so when those things were stripped from me, when I went to Reading, it was a, it was a good season for me to deal with some dysfunction that I think I picked up in ministry. And, yeah. uh, and so, yeah, it was, it was a painful season, but it was a fruitful one. And then, you know, some really incredible relationships came out of that as well that I'm still connected with today. And so, um, grateful for that time. Yeah, I could see that like both sides of you've kind of gotten this momentum of success in this one area of preaching and then you go to school and after that you really think you're going to go get launched out into what you want to do. Yep. Yep. So going back to a beginner position, no one really knows who you are probably mm -hmm. for the most part. You know, the kids there especially, like I didn't know you had done any of that. Yep. And so you're just like thrown back in this mix, which, you know, is like for me, the first time I ever went to a real estate event, I was pretty well known like in everywhere that I go in my industry, I went to an event and like, n you know, you just walk and everyone's like, you know, you, you're literally the worst cause I had, had not invested in real estate. So now I'm the worst cause now the measuring stick is what they care about, not what I care about. And, and then on top of that, no one knows who you are. And it's a very interesting thing. Uh, my friends had just had t just talked about this, that sometimes we can try to be the fruits of the spirit or do what Jesus and in if you had an encounter with Jesus, this is what you would do. And we try to like, just do it. And just like, we got to do all these things rather than it coming from like a natural reaction of an overflow of life. Um, and I just even picking that up, like it's such a huge transformation for people. And it's tough with an identity that many people that are listening, they may not be coming from momentum from 16 years old. They may be coming like I did from a carpet cleaning position where I was like, God, you've called me to build a business, but why would my identity is wrapped up in what I was doing in a negative way, not just in a positive way that was being challenged. So how have you what worked and dealt with that now? Because obviously you guys are building up. You're like, you can sometimes take that momentum, but not every day is a high day. Right. And it's easy sometimes to get wrapped up in the highs of the church, man, that, that everyone wants to volunteer now, everything's growing. And then like, well, now that that's the new average, cause averages keep changing. That means that yeah. even though you're better than you've ever been, there's still a down yeah. month. I, right. How have you dealt with that now with the identity side of not allowing the preaching to become your identity, but also even in serving and like being a pastor and not just doing it because that's what's required, but doing it out of an overflow. How have you been able to sustain that? Yeah, you know, something I'm super passionate about, especially it was that recently my wife and I, we went to the CrossFit Games in Madison, Wisconsin, and nice. got to watch, you know, the fittest in the world. And a lot of these guys, these girls Love there, it. I mean, they're like 18, 19 years old. And, you know, they only know this competitive world and when they don't win or when they get injured or when things happen that they weren't expecting, their entire world falls apart. We watched quite a few of them not even compete this year because of just the mental pressure of winning and not being the best. And um, we're seeing that more and more in the in the sports world in, in you know, the the pressure to perform and people just backing out completely. And, you know, I recently preached a message on this. It's kind of become like a life thing for me. There's a story in the Bible uh, where Moses sends out 12 spies into the promised land to, you know, scope out where they're supposed to go. And 
they get a glimpse of the future before they actually get to take the future. And, you know, that's often how life works with us is God will give you a vision um, before you're qualified or capable to take that territory. And what you do in that gap season is really important. Really, the mental games are the most important because when the 12 spies come back, 10 of the 12 say this. They say, we can't because those guys are bigger than us. The giants in the land, the cities are fortified. It's too impossible. We're outnumbered. They say we can't. And then they end their paragraph saying we are like grasshoppers in their eyes. So they say we can't, we're like grasshoppers. And then there's this young dude named Caleb that stands up and he's like, wait a second. Uh, we should go in there uh, and we can, and we will. And you see this completely different form of approaching the issue. They they all saw the same things, but the 10 out of the 12, which is the majority of people in our lives, see it from ability that then determines my identity. I'm not able, I'm not qualified, I'm not talented, I don't have the experience, I'm just getting started. Therefore, I'm a grasshopper. I'm not gonna succeed, I'm a failure. This is what I'm gonna be my whole life. And this defines me because I'm not capable versus the Caleb calculation that says we should. That word is a mandate word. It's a mission word. It's a word of identity. I, I'm, I'm called to this. God gave me a vision for this. He gave me a word for my life. I know that I'm, I burn to see this change in industry or business or whatever it is. I should do this. Therefore, I can do this. I may not be able to do it right now, but I'll figure it out. And when we ask ourselves, how do I define who I am? I don't define myself based on what I do, whether I'm a pastor, whether I'm running a restaurant, whether I'm you know, a real estate investor, those things are aspects of my life that will constantly change. If I lose my job tomorrow, if my church goes under, if you know, we lose our assets, whatever, that it is what it is. Life happens. You know, my wife, one of 10 kids in her family, Vietnamese, they came over from communist Vietnam and they built a life from nothing out here. And they built success. And then they walked through the housing crisis in 2008. Some of them lost everything and they had to rebuild. And if you build your identity based on what you do and the assets that you have or the experience that you have, then that's going to constantly be volatile and you will be depressed. You will be anxious. You'll be frustrated when things aren't going well. And when things are, you'll probably still not be happy because it's never enough. But when you build your identity based on your character, which is, I know what I'm called to be. I know what my integrity is. I know who I am in any season. So you put me in an industry that I don't know anything about. Well, I love what you said about golf. Like I just started playing golf recently. I've stayed away from it because I knew it would take my money and my time because I'm an all in type of guy. But here's what I believe. I suck at golf when I start, but I know I'm going to be great because I know who I am. And I may not know all the ways to hit the ball and the things that, but I'll figure it out because I, I know who I am. My character defines who I am. And so I would just encourage people that feel like they don't have the experience or maybe things haven't gone the way they thought they would go. You know, if you know who you are and your character is what defines you, it doesn't matter what obstacles you're facing or what failures you've experienced. You will bounce back from that because you're resilient. You're, you got tenacity. And at the end of the day, you are not going to quit because God called you to do it. And that is what separates winners from losers. It's people that choose to keep pressing on regardless of how they feel about themselves. They, they are going to keep moving forward. And so that's the key to success. In my opinion, that's the key to success. Well, we know that if you quit, you don't do anything. I, I, I like that, that even you talked about like your, your identity inside of your character and like, this is who I am. And when you put someone like this in this situation, I know kind of how this is going to go. I know I can adapt. I know I can get better rather than here's what I do. And, and right. now I'm this and this is who I am, which is it even feels like it's a good framework for people to understand. I feel like it, people understand that they're not supposed to get their identity for what they do, but they they don't know then what. So I'm supposed right. to get, they say, get yep. your identity in Christ. That he's well pleased in you. And right. you're like, and I'm supposed to walk away. Obviously, we believe like you've got to find your identity in Christ. You know, as Christians, that's that's our, you know, that's our foundation. But even if you don't know Jesus or you're not a follower of Christ, like if you don't have a depth to who you are outside of your rap sheet or, you know, your resume, um, 
it's, it's a really shallow life. And so some, one of the things I did with my staff a few years ago, um, around this teaching, you know, I had them sit down and I said, I want you to write out the person you want to become, not what you want to do, not the, the, the assets you want to have, like all those things, I believe they're going to happen, but I want you to write down who do you want to be or who do you feel like you are called to be? So for me, it's, you know, I feel called to be, um, an empowering leader, which means that people around me, I create opportunities for them. I equip them. I, I give them a higher ground to stand on than where they are right now. I, I feel called to be a, a competent communicator, right? So in everything that I do, whether it's as a husband, as a leader of a business or as a pastor, I know that my role, what I'm called to is to clearly and effectively communicate vision, right? And so these are, when you define who you're called to become, it, it really is a great practice and then everything else can flow from that. And, and I think that when you start writing those things down, if the areas of your life don't fit into them, then maybe it's not deep enough because once again, those things that I write out, they don't just affect my ministry. They affect my my marriage. They affect my family, my relationships, my work ethic. And so that's a really great practice. Write out, you know, maybe two to three things. Who is the person you want to become? The person the world needs you to be. And that will define what you do and your feelings of success around it. So good. Uh, I, I'm i glad you picked up golf, dude. It's, yeah. I just literally, I'm like, it was like three months ago, probably now decided to pick up golf again. I picked it up in when I was unsuccessful, which is a very like interesting topic in, in itself is like, man, even with business, I came into it very like spirit led, like God, like bring the people, let's go, let's serve them. And then everything failed. And like, I failed for three years and then I like learned the skill sets. And then I became so dependent on skill set that I was no longer like, gr I was like, I'm so kind of all in on the mission sometimes like you're talking about that. I'm like, well, if studying the Bible doesn't help me build the business, then like, I'm not going to study it as much or it's, it's a, a leisurely like benefit on top of after all the work gets done. I'm like, all right, beautiful. Now I can read. And, and, and then all of a sudden there was this merging of like, okay, this is not satisfying anymore. I want to incorporate these two worlds. And now it's like, I'm seeing them literally explode together like never before where now I have the skill set, but now I'm able to hear from God and not just be like a dead fish that has no fins and can't swim, even though he's like, go this way. That's what I felt like. But in with golf, that was tough as well. I was unsuccessful when I golf. It cost money. Time was a distraction. Who I golfed with probably wasn't the best either all the time. And so it was like not building anything. So coming back, I had those same feelings of like golf is bad because it's going to make me unsuccessful, waste all my time, money, and everyone I'm with. And man, the relationships that I've built through three, four hours on a golf course with someone is just absolutely unreal. And the fact that, dude, you could do it forever. Like I'm sold on it. I'm like, like I'm all in, all in yeah. meaning like it's a hobby that I'm going to try to do for an extended period of time. Yeah. What's been your like, how, how much, how all in have you actually gone on it so far as like, oh, a man, hobby? I I budgeted it for sure. So I, you know, CrossFit is my other obsession, right? So that's my thing. Um, I, I've had to decide because I'm super passionate about pickleball. I love pickleball and I really, and I do love golf. And so there's all these things I'm like having to manage and I just don't have time for all of them. So I, I've limited myself to, you know, I'll, I'll play. I mean, at this point I'm not good. So you know, I played my first 18 holes like two weeks ago and it was like three and a half hours. And I just like, I ain't got time for that. And so um, I got to get better. So it takes me less time to do that. Or I just got to cut out after the ninth. Um, my game went severely down after the ninth. I think, I think that was my yeah. threshold. Um, but I, you know, I, what was surprising is I've never played, I've never played golf before. I've only hit the driver at the driving range. The ironic part was that you still there. Yeah. Sorry. I got kicked off for a second. Um, the ironic part was that, so I was, I'd never hit with irons before. 
and I was crushing it with the irons. Like if it was a par three that I didn't have to use a driver, I was like, I hit it, you know, I was doing, I was almost on par, like I was killing it. Um, but the driver, like I was just slicing it like, boom, every single time. And so I, I got to really like, I got to really focus on that. So I, I'll, I'll give myself, you know, once a week maybe, but CrossFit, because I'm competitive in that, that is like the thing that takes up my time. And so, um, and that's a passion that like, if I don't do that, I'm not mentally okay in anything else that I'm doing. So I, I, yep. I kind of, I budget my time for that. more. Yeah, it's smart. I, uh, my wife and I did CrossFit for about three and a half years, maybe five if you count like the entire time. And it isn't, it is intense, man. Like it's a total sport. Mm-hmm. I was like all into what everyone was doing, man. I was like, if I could do three workouts in a day yeah. and CrossFit style workouts for people listening, right. like sometimes they'd be a, a 20 minute workout or a 12 minute workout or a three minute workout. And if I could kind of mix three of them together, I was like all in. And now like, you know, a different season, I'm like trying to mobility myself for golf. And I'm like, oh, I need to be more flexible and I need all this different stuff. Um, but I think that those things are so important because it's so easy to get caught up in just moving the needle. And then even when you move the needle, you're not happy because you're not doing anything that, that, I guess it would be go in the category of like taking care of yourself, like working out, eating healthy, being hydrated. I mean, you, you travel and probably see pastors all the time where you're like, bro, you should probably like go on a diet and stop preaching for like three months, bro. Like, just like, you can't, you can't figure that out. Like you can't drink enough water and like eat healthy. Like there's no discipline for that. And I could say you can't, but I'm like, bro, you need to like figure this out. Like, why are you even out here doing this stuff? You need to like, take like a month and just kind of figure out how to just be consistent with health stuff because yeah. it's such a big difference and it's required to be successful is to be able to take care of yourself and, yeah. and meaning like even your physical body. And I, I, people are seeing it more now, even in business, but dude, I had questions around uh, you. It's interesting. You came from ministry school mm-hmm. and then went to ministry school. There had to have been a part of you that was like, were you already sold on just coming for a year to Bethel? And what was like the difference between like your Dallas ministry school compared to Bethel? Like what were some of the pros and cons of both of them? Yeah, I, I don't, I didn't have a timeline of how long I was going to be in Reading, but I, I didn't want to be there. I knew I wasn't going to do three years. I mean, if, if I felt like I was supposed to, I would have, but I, I didn't feel that. And, um, and so I, I was pretty set on being there for a shorter amount of time. Um, there was, I mean, everything different about the two worlds, like Dallas and, and Reading were, they were complete opposites. And so my, my Bible college in Dallas was a a very disciplined discipleship, uh, driven kind of Bible college. And so lots of rules, uh, you know, like prayer every morning at five 30, like, you know, very, very structured, um, in that sense. And I'm super grateful that I had that experience before I went to Reading, because I think that because Reading, and once again, I love Bethel and I love what they're about when it's the grace culture. But I think when just, you know, it's just like giving your toddler uh, no rules. It's like, it's a, it can be a little bit irresponsible based on the maturity level of the person that's being given that type of environment. And so for me, I'm grateful that I, I, I got that foundation, you know, in Dallas. Uh, I was, I was very, uh, I, I had a good foundation of, you know, being, you know, character, um, just the stuff that no, but when nobody else is watching, you know, and, and, and so I really appreciated that about, about my, my season in Dallas, I think in Reading, it was, it was, a there was some unlearning that I had to do from Dallas to kind of get freed up and, you know, to realize like I'm a son and, and you know, God loves me and I, I don't have to perform for his favor. And, and so all of the stuff that we all receive at Bethel was a hundred percent, you know, my journey there of getting freed up from some of that unlearning, some religious stuff. Um, but they couldn't have been more different. And yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I'm grateful for both of them. I think both of them were necessary. 
but very, very different together. And then what was your journey trajectory in the ministry afterwards? Like I talked about with business, I only went to Bethel, right? Because I had a radical encounter at 18, met someone who went to Bethel and we went to a hospital where he started getting words of knowledge and telling people what was wrong with them and they were all getting healed. Mm. And I was like, I had no, cl I didn't even know like to believe for that or where that was yeah. found. So yeah. I was like, where do you get that? And he was like, well, I live in Reading and I go to Bethel Church. And anybody you read, it's like, it's just really the supernatural side of ministry is like kind of what the school is known for. So I was like, I'm going like, this is where I'm going. Yeah. The tough part with going from there to the business was a lot of that. Like, if you put any effort into anything, you're like works kind of fits in with work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's like, I, I felt so bad that I'd want to build the business with my hands and like go out there. Where it was almost like I had all the tools to build a, a actual home, right. but I was scared to grab them because I felt yeah. like I was doing it all and I wouldn't rely on God to be able to do right. it. Sounds right. ridiculous in that sense. So for you, leaving from both of those in your ministry, what was your trajectory like? Like, were you, you know, famous and crushed it right away? <laughs> and and what what did you have? What did you run into with that learning that you got from yeah. both that you kind of had to figure out on the way? Yeah, I I don't think I ever had that problem or ever really bought into that idea of just like not working for things because. I'm just not built that way. Like I am, I'm the guy that I'm the Martha, right. That needs to chill out and like sit. Cause Jesus is in the room. I don't have a problem like sitting and like getting to work. Um, and so I think like Bethel was definitely helpful in teaching me. Yeah. Grace. And, and I, but once again, I, I grew up in church. I, I knew a lot of those things. Um, it was more of like a forceful season of like, you know, I always say that song where he makes me lay down in uh, green pastures. Like I felt like he made me lay down for a season. Um, yeah. But once I got out of there, I was like ready to build. And in fact, while I was at Bethel, I had already started because I, I felt like the Lord said, you're going to go be a youth pastor somewhere. And so I started building out youth systems, ministry structures. I built out an entire discipleship curriculum while I was at Bethel, just in faith, believing that it was going to happen. Wow. And so um, when I got the call that from a church that was, it was really an incredible, especially for a guy just coming out of Bible college, a young guy who had no pastoral experience uh, with a great salary and a great you know opportunity to start. Like I was already ready with, um, you know, leadership systems and, and building structures and, uh, discipleship curriculum. So when we got in, we went to work and, you know, we had, it was in a small little West Texas town in, uh, called Abilene, Texas. And, you know, there was about seven kids in the youth ministry. And by the time I left there, we were running around 300 kids in a church of wow. about 300 at the time. And so, um, you know, revival really hit that church, and, but it was work. Like it, it was never, it, you know, I've never had this. Paul said this, he says, I am what I am by the grace of God, yet I worked harder than all of the others. And he's talking about the apostles that he had to go submit to when he first was called because he didn't walk with Jesus. So when he got his ministry call, he went to the apostles and said, hey, this is the message that Jesus gave me. Is this legit? Like, am I ready to go out? And they approved it. And he says this, I am what I am by the grace of God. So I, I don't take credit for what I am but I work harder than everybody else. And so it's this tension of like, grace is what got me here, but I freaking work hard, man. Like, and I, yeah. I preach harder, I study harder, I travel harder. And so that's like my life motto is when people ask me how I got to where I've gotten, it's by the grace of God. I didn't, I didn't get myself here only by God's grace, but I, I work hard and I, yeah. I don't, I don't let anybody outwork me. And so that's, that's a work ethic and a character and an integrity thing, you know? And so I think my trajectory was come to youth. So I became a youth pastor in Abilene, did that for three years, got an invitation from there to go be a part of Elevation Church in North Carolina with Stephen Verdick. And so I moved to Charlotte, did their staffing program and was offered a full-time position um, after about a year with them um, and was planning on being there for 
forever. Like I, I, I thought that, so that you was really cool. liked it. I loved it. Yeah. I mean, I struggled with some things, but I loved this. Like, dude, every night I lay my head on my pillow. I felt like I freaking worked hard. And, you know, as a pastor, you get paid by the tithe money of people. We say, if you're getting paid by people tithes, tithes, you better be working really hard. Like you better be earning that, you know? And so that, that pace, that mission out there was just, it was the first time I felt this like, man, people get it. Like we are on mission. We got to take over the world. And so, um, so I was there for a year, offered the full-time job, felt like the Lord. Actually, I was watching a Bill Johnson message um, the week I was offered the job, the uh, message called More at Any Cost. And the Lord spoke to me right there and says, you're not going to stay here. I'm going to call you to be a voice for revival and it's not going to be in Charlotte. I went out, I got this tattoo on my arm right here that said, I am revival. And uh, I, I, I basically turned down the job offer, moved back to Dallas, and then stepped into a season of full-time travel for about two years where I, I traveled to about three different cities every week, preaching conferences, churches, different events, doing consulting work with churches coming out of elevation. That was kind of like the next step was consulting. And then um, long, long story short, I got a call from a guy named Q who I had worked with in Charlotte. Um, and he was in Sacramento leading what was known as Elevation Extension Sacramento. And he said, hey, listen, we've been out here for a few years. Things aren't working out. We're about to launch our own autonomous church. Would you want to come out and be the pastor? And so I came out and visited Sacramento. I'd only known Sacramento from when I lived in Reading and we came out here to get closed because there was no place to shop in Reading. And so yeah. I was like, I ain't trying to go to Sacramento. Uh, but I, I fell in love with the city. I fell in love with the people, moved out here in 2017, took over the church. And then I ended up, uh, Q is now my campus pastor and I married his sister. So now we're all in the family. That's so wild, dude. Uh, the last thing I'll leave, I'll leave you with, and then we'll wrap up because I want to honor your time is that this, the work ethic side. I love that. I, I love even the way that you put it just like by the grace of God, but I'm going to work harder than every single person. And and that's what everyone kind of neg neglects is like, you see Tiger Woods and all these people, they just crush it. And it's like, dude, I hit a thousand balls a day. Like it wasn't, wasn't just like I was talented or I didn't just want it. I had to back it up. Now on this other side though, going to Bethel school of supernatural ministry and there's like fire tunnels and words of knowledge and, and accurate things and things happening, healings and all this stuff. How do you also not just get into this mode of like, all right, I know exactly what to do. I need to get these couple scriptures, build this message, crush yeah. the message, lean on hard work and skill set yeah. and, and, and balance those two worlds of feeling like okay, I'm, I'm actually developing this spiritual life that isn't just outward physical hard work. Like I need I, this spiritual disciplines as well. Cause there's yeah. going to be one of two guys, right? There's going to be the guy who crushes it spiritually, loves the Lord, but just is not getting anything done. Yep. And then there's guys that just get so much done, yep. but they just never really see God move in their life. I hear them all the time. They're like, I've just never felt God before. I've never seen him do anything. Right. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, you're so busy freaking working that you like literally don't invest any time in that area. And obviously there's people in the middle, but we want to bridge those two things. Yeah. You talked about the work one. I thought that was great on the, the spiritual side. How do you, how do you grow in that? Or how would you attack that? Yeah. And this is probably the biggest thing I do when I talk to like guys in business. I have a, a group of men that I meet with regularly that um, are, are in the business world and that's, you know, they're, their challenge is like, how do I mix the secular and the sacred? Because I know how to be effective in the secular world. I know the systems and the disciplines and the habits that I have to implement. And so there's almost this dichotomy between like church exists in its church compartment and spirituality is great, but like, it doesn't like, I don't know how it applies to my business or my financial success. And I, I just say there, it, there could be nothing further from the truth. Growing spiritually affects every part of your life. And it's not the prosperity gospel. It's the full gospel because Jesus didn't come to save us to only save the spiritual part of our lives. If you look throughout the entire scriptures, the covenant affects your fertility. It 
affects your finances. It affects your business. It affects your land. It affects every area of your life. And so this idea that growing spiritually would not affect my professional life is a lie from the enemy to keep you from being blessed. God wants to bless you so supernaturally that in ways you can't. And so just for example, my wife and I, we faced some serious business challenges about during the COVID years, especially with the restaurants, it was terrible. And, you know, walked through some serious loss and had to, had to deal with a lot of the fallout from some failed businesses. And a lot of that came to a head this past year. And just this past month, you know, we were going through the numbers and really anxious about some challenges that we got financially and trying to figure out a strategy on how do we bring, we know what to do. We know how to cut a budget. We know how to bring in more money. We know like we know how to work hard, but when we look at all the solutions, none of them made sense for number one, our, per, our calling right now. And number two, it would just take a lot more time and unnecessary energy. And so we just didn't have an answer. We just knew we needed to be bringing in more. And we're strategizing and trying to think through it. And the Lord just was like, hello, why are you not bringing this to me? Like, and, and so the Lord challenged me to fast and pray. And so we started fasting and praying and, and I started doing a daily declaration of faith. Just, I have access to unlimited resources, financial blessings from the Lord. Like I have access to everything because I'm a son. And we start just believing in faith. And I kid you not, the next week, we get a check in the mail for $38,000, had no idea where that money came from, just came out of the blue. And then two days later, we get a check for $8,000 from an overpaid escrow account we didn't even know existed. And bro, like everything that we wow. would have taken us maybe a year to try to recoup was done in like an instant. And it's like easy for God. But when we tried to strategize around it, it would take us time, energy, effort. And, and that's the difference between grace and God's divine favor and our human efforts. Like you can do something and, and work to try to accomplish something, but why would you do it by yourself when God has given you so many promises to take it to another level? And so when you start operating in faith, and that's for the business owner, for the entrepreneur, it's not that you replace skill sets with just get on your face for, you know, 365 days a week in prayer and fasting. But if you never make margin, I, I always say like, where's the faith factor in your business strategy? If you don't have a faith factor, a generosity factor, a, an active trusting in God to say, we are going to sow a seed here, or we're going to believe divinely that God's going to provide for this because we, you know, I've been praying into this, then, you know, you're really missing out on, on crazy blessing that God wants to bring to you. And so, Yes, we have to bring our skill and effort, but when God's the when the wind of the Holy Spirit blows on that thing that you're doing, it can take it from here to there in an instant. That would take you years to try to get it. And so, man, you got to have the faith factor. The faith factor is what makes Christian entrepreneurs and business people separated from the rest because you've got grace, man. 100% and having God be the multiplier of what you're doing is ultimately what our goals are as Christian yeah. men in business. So dude, thank you so much again. Want to honor your time. This has been so yeah. fun hearing your journey, how things have gone since ministry school and just seeing you guys blow up for the guys that are hearing your stuff and maybe want to hear more messages or, or get more clips of what you're doing and be more involved. What's the best way they can connect with you? Yeah. You can follow me on Instagram. It's Jared C A L S um, on Instagram. Um, and then, uh, all of my spiritual content messages and stuff is on our E2 church YouTube page. You can watch them there. Uh, we're also on TikTok. Uh, but yeah, just social media would probably be the easiest way. Awesome. So if you're listening to this, especially if you made it here, you're going to want to go connect to those things to just, again, even on social, you open your phone, you hit an explore page real quick. You're going to see a bunch of stuff you don't want to see. If you want mm -hmm. more stuff that you actually want to see in front of you. This is the way to go do it. Go connect with this stuff. It'll also be down below this video and audio as well. So appreciate you do. This has been awesome and just praying massive success over everything you guys do. Thank you so much, my friends. Great to hear from you.